All right, well, it says live, so it looks like we're live, okay? All right. Okay, so welcome everyone to tonight's program, uh, Cell Phone Astrophotography with Wiesner. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I might say Michael needs no introduction, but I'm going to, to, to give it a try anyway. He's done so many things, it's hard to, it's hard to even summarize this, but of course, most, most significant to us is his, his uh, long-term interest in uh, astrophotography. Uh, which he dates back to his interest in astronomy, age six, when his older brother introduced him to the subject. Um, I think he got his first telescope when he was something like 13. Got also got involved in astrophotography at a young age using old technology, a camera and film. Uh, there were no obviously no digital cameras and so forth in those days. Um, and then uh, in college, uh, Majored in no surprise here astro uh, astrophysics uh, and uh, obtained his uh, bachelor of science degree in astrophysics. Did some graduate work in um, meteorology. Then joins the U.S. Air Force. Became a fighter pilot, an instructor, and a um, manager in the space shuttle program. Uh, had a long career with uh, TRW, major aerospace. aerospace uh, company where he uh, uh, managed uh, various programs for that company. Uh, and then in his retirement years has devoted, uh, uh, well, he has a lot of interests, but certainly devoted uh, a lot of those, uh, his time and those interests to various aspects of astronomy. Uh, he has lectured, he has written books, he's written articles, he's been interviewed. Uh, but a particular interest to us is his, his uh, specialization in uh, astrophotography. And so tonight he's going to share uh, uh, various techniques and, and um, other uh, insights uh, with us. Um, as I mentioned at the end, we, we, we will take questions, but in the meantime, please, uh, please do type your uh, questions into the chat. All right, thanks, Michael. Well, thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, it's it's a real thrill for me to actually be speaking to the San Francisco amateur astronomers. I lived in Southern California, Redondo Beach area, Torrance, uh, Rolling Hills Estates, um, from 1980 until uh, 2007, and in from 1990 through the early 2000s. I would go up to San Francisco for the Macworld Expos, and then over to San Jose many years for the Apple Developers Conference. Uh, so I really enjoyed my those you know weeks up in San Francisco area. It's a beautiful city. I always felt very safe back then. You know, walking around that community at nighttime. Uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, lots of really neat stuff to do there, lots of great food. Uh, so like I say, I really am thrilled to be talking to a bunch of you people from San Francisco. So, so let's go ahead and get started. So am I back to being able to share again? Nope. Yes, I am. Good. Okay. So see if this will work. Hey, all right. So I think you all can see my screen now. So we're gonna talk about, uh, as Bill said, cell phone astrophotography or smartphone astrophotography. Um, and we'll see how it goes here for the next hour or so. So Bill kind of gave me an introduction, but I'm gonna show you some of the pictures that go along with what he had to say. So as he said, I've been an amateur astronomer since 1954 when I was six years old. Uh, there you can see my Edmund Scientific Telos three inch Newtonian telescope uh, that was a Christmas present in 1961, taken out in front of our home in Southern Indiana uh, on Easter Sunday morning. 
love the hat there. And then in 2016, I was back uh, for my uh, 50th high school reunion. So went over to my old home, uh, asked the people who lived there if I could go out and recreate that picture. So there I am with my same old telescope out in front of the same chimney. Um, I became famous with my ETX website that I started in 1996, and that's still going on today. As Bill said, I've got an astrophysics degree from Indiana University in 1970. I was an Air Force A-70 fighter pilot and also taught uh, fighter tactics uh, using the T-38. So the, those are both fun assignments to do. My last assignment in the Air Force was I was a manager on the Air Force's space shuttle program there in Los Angeles. After I left the Air Force, I was a senior manager at a large aerospace company. I retired from there in 2007. The wife and I purchased our retirement land here in Oracle, Arizona, just north of Tucson in 2004. Uh, after I retired, we got moved uh, out to Tucson area, started building the house up here, um, got moved to Oracle in 2009, and I got my own little astronomical observatory there. Uh, there's a 12-inch Mead telescope in there at the time. In 2017, I was interviewed for a very special show on by a uh, local Tucson PBS station uh, on their Arizona Illustrated segments. And uh, it was a real thrill to be able to do this. Uh, they did part of it out of Oracle State Park or a local international dark sky park uh, that I helped uh, get that going. Um, but the, the neat thing that kind of happened uh, with this uh, show that they had was it was nominated for an Emmy Award. So it didn't win, but it was certainly a thrill to be nominated for a show that uh, had an Emmy Award, so, or nominated for an Emmy Award. You can actually see that if you go search for it. <clears throat> it's also linked off of my website. <clears throat> I may lose my voice tonight. I'll make a gratuitous plug. Bill kind of mentioned it. Uh, this is my autobiography published in May of 2021. And it's basically, you know, uh, a true story of all my successes, all my failures, what good things happened, what bad things happened through my life, and how I ended up sort of meandering around my path, uh, finding my way to the stars, because it was, there were lots of deviations uh, as I moved along in various careers and, and different uh, things that I thought I wanted to do. So all that is detailed uh, there in my book. Disclaimer. So I like to just say that I just play at astrophotography. I don't spend hours and hours capturing photons from one object like I know a lot of people do, and they certainly enjoy it. I don't enjoy doing that. I don't spend lots of hours and hours post-processing individual images. I generally don't stack my images. So you're not going to see you know, images that are taken over many, many hours of one object. That's why using my iPhone for astrophotography works for me. I've also used my Nikon, currently using a Nikon D850 DSLR for my ast other astrophotography, but I've imaged with a whole set of Nikon DSLRs over the years. So my early astrophotography, as Bill kind of hinted there, I uh, started doing astrophotography with that Edmund 3-inch Newtonian telescope. And in December of 64, there was a total solar eclipse visible from Seymour, Indiana, my hometown. And I, my photos actually made the front page right below the banner there uh, of the local newspaper. So that was kind of a thrill. <laughs> so became famous right away for astrophotography. So what we're going to talk about, I'm going to quickly run through, of course, what is astrophotography. Many of you are already familiar with a lot of this, uh, but it kind of puts us all on the same uh, footing. What do you need to do astrophotography? What types of astrophotography there are? <clears throat> I'm going to talk about smartphone adapters and some details uh, so you know what to buy. Um, we're going to show you a bunch of examples of my iPhone astrophotography. And I'm going to do that to kind of get you intrigued about what you can do with your cell phones. We'll talk briefly about video recording astrophotography. I'll give you a bunch of uh, uh, some information about some uh, astrophotography apps. I'll give you a bunch of tips. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about some simple in image editing that you can do to improve your images, and then we'll do a wrap up. So what is astrophotography? Well, obviously it's photography of astronomical objects, whether it's the sun with a proper filter or just the night sky. 
the moon, planets, asteroids, all your favorite objects there. Development began in the mid 1800s using telescopes and metal photographic plates. They started using glass plates at the professional observatories in the 1900s. Roll films started being used by amateur astronomers, including me, in the mid 1900s. Then we got into the special expensive uh, imagers that began use in the 1970s at the professional observatories. As the price of those dropped, amateur astronomers started using them in the 1990s. I did not. Digital cameras began being used by amateur astronomers, including me, in the mid 1900s, or mid 1990s. And of course, cell phone astrophotography began in the early 2000s. So, what do you need to do astrophotography? Well, it depends. So we're going to look at a bunch of examples of astrophotographs of uh, Messier 17, the Swan Nebula or the Omega Nebula, if you prefer. So this one, if you got $2 billion, not including operating expenses, you can use the Hubble Space Telescope to take a picture of M17. If you got just a few hundreds of millions of dollars, you could use a big observatory, a big telescope down in Chile and get an image like that. Pretty nicely detailed, lots of, uh, lots of information there on that picture. But if you've only got a few millions of dollars to spend, you could use, uh, whoops, come on. You could use, oops, come on, behave there. Uh, the, the wind telescope out here at Kitt Peak near Tucson, uh, the 0.9 millimeter telescope. If you got about $8,000 you want to spend on astrophotography, you could get something like Robert Weiss's uh, very exotic system with an Apple refractor telescope, high-end imagers, lots of filters, uh, a very good mount, and he gets some pretty interesting pictures there as well. Or for just a few thousands of dollars, you could do what I've done, which is my DSLR on my originally into my eight inch telescope and now a 12 inch telescope in my observatory. So that's what Swan Nebula looks like uh, just through a single image, not stacked, uh, just one picture of the Swan Nebula. Or you want to spend even less money, maybe depending upon how much you want to spend on your telescope and how much you want to spend on your phone, you can do an iPhone or an Android phone uh, on the eyepiece of a telescope and get that kind of an image of uh, the Swan Nebula. That's an image that looks very similar to what you see in the eyepiece. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end up talking about what you see from versus what you can uh, photograph. So just very briefly, a lot of people like to think about the uh, digital camera sensor sizes, you know, from the dedicated imagers, the DSLRs. So then you get down to the smartphone, obviously has a very, very small digital sensor in there. And that really only gets applicable when you start thinking about um, how much data you're actually going to be able to capture. So what do you really need? Well, depends on what you already have and what you want to photograph, obviously. You probably already do have what you need. You've probably already got a telescope. You probably or binoculars or a spotting scope. You probably already have a cell phone, smartphone. Digital SLRs and point and shoot cameras and, and smartphones can make you an astrophotographer. So the rest of this talk is going to be about smartphone astrophotography. So today's phone cameras are doggone pretty amazing. So here's a couple of pictures of my observatory with the moon being projected from the 12-inch telescope up onto the observatory dome. And you notice there in the background, there's some stars. Picture over on the right, here's Perseus, constellation of Perseus with the Pleiades over here on the right side. And that's just a handheld, <clears throat> handheld phone picture. Pretty impressive. So types of astrophotography. There's simple night sky photography. You just see some stars or an aurora, you're gonna take a picture. You can put your camera, your cell phone on a tracking mount or piggyback on your telescope. You can do prime focus astrophotography with some cameras, but typically not with smartphones because the lens is not removable. Now we'll say that there's a gentleman down in South America who has taken his iPhone or his Android phone apart taking the lens off, and he does some pretty exotic uh, prime focus photography directly imaging right onto the, the cell phone uh, sensor. But typically people are gonna take the lens off their thousand dollar smartphones. So prime focus astrophotography won't apply to us today. A focal astrophotography through the eyepiece absolutely will apply. 
IEP's projection astrophotography, again, doesn't apply to the smartphone because the lens is not removable. So early smartphone astrophotography. Though I was actually not the first cell phone camera astrophotographer. My EPTX site had several submissions of moon images back in the mid 2000s. Or Steve Jobs, who was Apple CEO, unveiled the original iPhone in January of 2007. And I think I took the first ever Apple iPhone astrophotograph on Christmas Eve of 2007 using an ETX 70 refractor. And it was just a handheld image. So that's what that image was. Over the years, I've continued to do iPhone astrophotography with lots of different telescopes, binoculars, clip on telephoto lenses, and of course, ever improving iPhone models. Of course, you can do terrestrial photography through telescopes, spotting scopes, binoculars, night scopes, even clip on lenses. And you'll see some examples of that as we go along tonight. So handheld astrophotography. So that's the way you're going to get started. And we're going to talk originally here, initially, of uh, doing afocal photography through the telescope. So the easiest way to get started is just by hand holding the phone over the eyepiece for afocal images. And you can see me uh, with an ETX 105 there, just hand holding the phone over the eyepiece. Limited to brighter objects like the moon and the planets, because you've got to keep the shutter speed fast since you're hand holding. And it's challenging to keep the camera aligned properly over the eyepiece. As you're hand holding, it's easy to kind of drift in and out, uh, up and down across the eyepiece field of view. And so it becomes a challenge keeping things properly aligned. And it's difficult to avoid blurring because, again, you're hand holding. And if you're trying to do longer exposures, it's going to be a real challenge. Basic technique uh, applies to all a focal imaging. Going to focus the object in the eyepiece to your eye. Going to hold the camera over the eyepiece. You're going to let the auto exposure do its thing and then adjust if necessary and if it's possible with the app that you're using. Of course, it's better to use a, an app that's got manual exposure settings, and we'll talk about that later. And then you just take the picture. If it didn't work out, delete it, try again, obviously. So here's some examples of handheld. A uh, very thin crescent moon there on the left, earth shine in the middle, and of course, easy to take uh, crater photographs of, uh, uh, for the moon. So, oops, there we go, missed one. Uh, Venus, nice crescent Venus. Venus later this year is gonna be turning into a nice crescent. Makes it an excellent target for uh, smartphone astrophotography. Galilean moons, also easy to capture, uh, even doing it handheld. Solar eclipse, this was done the one of the partial phase. These were both done in uh, August of 2017. Uh, the partial phase there on the left was with a clip-on eight power telephoto lens and a little solar filter. And you'll see that later on. Um, we've got a, an annual eclipse coming up later this year. Uh, so think about, uh, you know, you might want, want to photograph the, the partial phases of that or even the total phase of the annual. Uh, with something like a clip-on eight-bar telephoto lens, easily done. And then, of course, the corona there on the right-hand side. So, but the best way, of course, is to mount the phone onto the eyepiece. So what I did back in 2010, I got tired of hand-holding the phone over the eyepiece. I made a little adapter. I used an eyepiece clamp from an old camera focal adapter and a short piece of 10-gauge rubber-coated wire. So that was my initial prototype, which held my iPhone 3GS, if any of you remember that model from way back when. Uh, and it worked out pretty well, uh, but it wasn't real secure on the mount. And as the telescope slewed around, I was always worried about it falling out. So I made a little bit better one that, was, that held the phone tighter. In fact, in that picture there in the lower right-hand corner, you can actually see a, a partial phase Venus on the screen. That was a live view. Mounted astrophotography, it's the way to go with a smartphone. There's many different types and styles of adapters. They cost anywhere from 20 bucks up to $100. Most of those are universal and they support a wide range of phone sizes and camera location. Some are specific to certain smartphone models or sizes and where the camera is located. So that means when you upgrade your phone, you might need to get a new one of those kind of specific adapters. Some work with spotting scopes and binoculars and some have a tripod mounting hole. Not all of them though. 
But as with handheld imaging through the eyepiece, getting the camera lens aligned right over the eyepiece can still be a challenge using those universal adapters because they are universal. So this is one uh, adapter that I have that this particular model has been discontinued from Orion, but it's very similar to other model uh, universal adapters that Orion has. It supports only one and a quarter inch eyepieces up to about a one and a half inch tube diameter. And so there you can see a phone mounted on the eyepiece of my telescope in the observatory. There is no tripod mounting hole for these universal adapter, this type of universal adapter, but you might be able to attach it uh, to a tripod if you can find a, a small little gap in one of the brackets that you can insert the uh, tripod bolt up through. Most smartphone models are supported with this type of universal design. 11 hook smartphone adapters, $30, and this is my preferred smartphone adapter. It supports the small little, very old style, 0.965 inch eyepieces like were included with my three inch Newtonian telescope from Edmund Scientific, uh, standard one and a quarter inch eyepieces and two inch eyepieces, killers and spotting. So you can see lots of examples, uh, 15 by 70 pair of binoculars, just back on that eyepiece. Uh, here's an eight bar monocular uh, aimed out past my observatory because way off 65 miles away is Kitt Peak National Observatory. So that's this flat top mountain. So that's a view of the mountaintop. 65 miles away, just a handheld smartphone picture. It's got a tripod mounting pole, so you can put it on a photographic tripod. And most smartphone models are supported. PhoneScope has this, what they call their digiscoping adapter. It's $100. It includes a case that your phone snaps into, and then an eyepiece adapter. This eyepiece adapter, they have several different size, size and models. They support, uh, one of them supports a one and a quarter inch eyepiece up to a 1.8 inch uh, tube diameter. And it supports two inch eyepieces up to 2.3 inch tube diameter. And so there you can see it's mounted on the, my little ETX refractor. They do have adapters for binoculars and spotting scopes and rifle scopes. So here you can see I have an Ioptron SkyTracker Pro with a pair of 12 by 50 binoculars on the tracking mount, and the iPhone is mounted onto an eyepiece of the binoculars. And here's going through another pair, the same pair of binoculars, but just on a tripod no tracking, but Cacho Peak is way up in the distance. That's 31 miles as the crow flies. And so here is the view seen through that uh, 12 power binocular. So for terrestrial photography, doing something like this is kind of cool. You can really get some neat shots. But like I say, you need a specific one of these cases uh, for your particular smartphone model. What it does do though, is it eliminates the optical alignment challenge because these eyepiece adapters in the case are designed to put the optical center of the eyepiece right where the camera lens is. So again, you know, as your phone models change or you, you, you get a new upgrade or you just you have different style phones, you're gonna be switching back and forth between Android and iPhone, you've gotta have a different case. So let's just very briefly step through a whole slew of examples of things that I've done. You saw a picture earlier of Earthshine. So there's another picture of Earthshine. Lunar mountain shadows. I love taking pictures of lunar mountain shadows and, and craters on the moon are easy to capture. So that's Copernicus, see the central peaks there. Total lunar eclipse. Uh, all phases there, you can do that with just with your iPhone. Easier if you have a tracking mount, but not required for a lunar eclipse. Do sunspots if you've got a good filter, a safe solar filter, you can do the brighter asteroids. So there's Ceres with an older style iPhone back in 2015. You can get transits of the space stations across the sun and the moon. So this was the first Chinese space station, which was much smaller than the International Space Station, uh, transiting the sun. So all those dots are the space station transiting over the sun. 
you can do planets. So these are single image, not stacked, pictures of Mars during the opposition a couple of years ago and Saturn. So Mars, you can see the south polar cap, uh, Sirius Major, and of course Cassini division in the rings over here on Saturn. Daytime, Jupiter conjunction back in 20, December 2020, when they were closest, they're here in, you know, where we live on the west coast of uh, the country, um, they were closest at six minutes of arc in the daytime. So here's Jupiter and up here is faintly Saturn. So I did get them both. Our recent comet ZTF, just you know, with your iPhone. Double clusters. Star clusters, uh, both open and globular, are great targets for uh, smartphones. Uh, you can see some of the colors in the Alberio, the beautiful, colorful, dull star there on the right. You, you can capture colors with your smartphone. Omega Centauri is visible from here in southern Arizona. It's very low on the horizon. Uh, you can't see it from up in San Francisco, but for down here, it's a neat target for a few weeks in the summertime. Uh, or in the springtime, and then M22 globular clusters. So globular clusters make great targets for cell phones. But you can go to fainter nebulae. So there's the blue snowball. This picture on the left, you see the full frame version, and then you uh, magnify just the nebula, and you can see quite a bit of the detail there. Oops, doggone it. Don't do that. You see quite a bit of the detail uh, in the nebula there. And of course, the Dumbo Nebula there on the right. Start to see some of the colorings of the nebulae. Eskimo Nebula. Again, magnified view, you can see some of the structure of the nebula. And one of my favorite objects is M46 Open Cluster and the NGC 2438 uh, Planetary Nebula. Those are neat to look at in the eyepiece, and you can photograph it with a smartphone. Hubble's Variable Nebula. Taken to two different magnifications, uh, two different power height pieces. Uh, so what's neat about photographing the Hubble's variable nebula is because it is a variable nebula. Over a period of years, if you keep taking photographs with your smartphone, you can track changes in Hubble's variable nebula. So that can be a neat project for somebody. Triffid Nebula, nice bright nebula, very pretty. Uh, and you get all the colors with your smartphone. And of course, the great Orion Nebula makes a great target. In fact, it makes a great first target when you start wanting to do DSO imaging with your smartphone. More challenging is the Triangulum Galaxy. Uh, and I live in a nice dark sky location here in Southern Arizona. So I can actually see that with my naked eye occasionally. Um, but you can photograph it with a smartphone. On the right there is the Leo triplet of galaxies. So we've got M6, M65, M66, and NGC 3628 Sarah's galaxy over here, a fainter galaxy that's still all within the same field of view, low power. You can do supernova. So here was a supernova uh, in, in uh, NGC 4647. Several years ago, a couple, you know, just last year, excuse me, um, and some barrel galaxy. You see the dust lane coming, dividing the galaxy there. Whirlpool galaxy, kind of a neat object to look at, but geez, photographing it with a smartphone, you can really make out the spiral structure really nicely and some of the color. So that's kind of cool to be able to do that with just a smartphone. Bode's galaxy, M81, Cigar galaxy. Uh, M82, both in the same field of view, using a low power on, on the telescope, and then a little higher magnification, uh, getting the Cigar Galaxy. You can see the colors. You can see the dust lane through the center there, done with just a smartphone. So all those previous examples were taken with my 8-inch or 12-inch telescope. But, geez, you can use almost any telescope with your smartphone. A tracking mount will help but it's not necessary for the bright objects. So again, my old three inch Newtonian telescope, taking pictures of a lunar eclipse many years ago. My ETX 70 millimeter refractor doing the dumbbell nebula and the Andromeda galaxy. Now, if you've got a low end refractor that you don't think is useful for a lot, put your smartphone on it. You might be surprised what you feel the image. My old ETX 90 that I bought in 1996, uh, that ended up starting my ETX website. 
Ryan Nebula is a very easy target for that one. My ETX 125 doing planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and the Hercules the globular cluster M13. An old style Althaz mount, no tracking, no motor drives, no nothing, just a 102 millimeter refractor, M42 and Ryan Nebula, Moon and Earth Sun. So you can use any telescope to take pictures with a smartphone. So those smartphone adapters that have a one and a quarter inch tripod mounting hole will allow your, tel your smartphone to be mounted onto a camera tripod, piggyback uh, on your telescope, uh, or a camera tracking amount. So again, on the right, you can see the smartphone is attached to the iOptron SkyTracker Pro, and it's got a clip-on wide-angle lens of, with this particular model. And here, my iPhone is piggyback on my 12-inch telescope, so I can take advantage of all the guiding functions that, that come with a big telescope and take you know, longer exposures and not have to deal with guiding issues. And this picture here in the center is that eight-power uh, Tip on telephoto lens with this solar filter from Spectrum Telescope is the company. Uh, I just checked, it's currently out of stock, but that is a really neat product. I really like that. With your smartphone on a tripod, you can do star trails with an app that will do star trails, get lots of satellites, get lots of airplanes over a period of time, obviously. International Space Station there on the right, taken from inside my observatory as the space station uh, passed by. So you get that nice trail of the space station going across the sky. So Bill was talking about um, pictures through binoculars. That comes up a little bit later. But here's an eight power clip on telephoto lens on that tracking mount. Pleiades on the left and the BI cluster on the right. Piggybacked on a telescope for the constellation of Orion. On the right-hand side, M31 galaxies, you're getting Andromeda and, and magnified image of M31 there at the top. So again, piggybacking on a tracking mount telescope, getting the Orion Nebula on the right-hand side there in the center. You can see me looking through the eyepiece as I'm uh, tracking the, uh, the object. I piggyback my 12 by 50 binoculars on the telescope mounted the camera, mounted the smartphone on the, the eyepiece of the binoculars. And so here's the Leo trip of the galaxies. So we've got M65, M66, and very faintly, I don't know how well it's showing up in Zoom, uh, but right in there is Sarah's galaxy and GC3628. So you can take pictures through binoculars. But briefly, let's talk about video recording. So when you're imaging planets with a smartphone, it can be beneficial to do video recording. It doesn't work for DSOs because they're too faint. But for planets, it works out pretty nicely. You can get hundreds to thousands of video frames in a short period of time using the 24 frames per second all the way up to the 240 frames per second that are supported by the modern smartphones. Then you can stack all or just the best frames using stacking software on your computer. So here's Venus, nice thin crescent Venus, uh, nearly 2,000 frames that were stacked. Whoops, uh, pretty high power, 400 magnification. Mars at the opposition, again, you know, 2,500 frames. Again, stacking all the frames, not just the best ones. So again, you got the South Polar Cap and the little North Polar Hood, cloud hood up there. Jupiter, great red spot. Cassini division on Saturn, again, pretty high magnification, 400 power. But again, stacking 2,000 video frames. So now let's get into smartphone apps. So obviously the smartphones do include an app, but that may have limited functionality in, in both the exposure settings and how it focuses on objects. When it's trying to do its automatic focus on stars, it may have a problem. So it can't find, it'll keep hunting. It'll, it won't be able to find a good focus. And there's no intervalometer mode, meaning there's no way to set up timed exposures, multiple exposures, things like that. And there's no special modes for doing long exposures or star trails or the satellite pictures like you saw earlier. So there are many more capable apps for both Android and Apple smartphones. So 
couple for the Android or Deep Sky Camera and AstroCam. They give you full exposure control and they stack images on, on the phone itself. But I've not used those since they're Android, so I can't really talk anything about them. On the iPhone side, Nightcap Camera, $3. That's the most capable feature-rich app for iPhone astrophotography. It's my preferred app. It's got full exposure control. It does image stacking on the phone, and it's got a whole slew of exposure modes. Full disclosure, I've been a beta tester of Nightcap Camera for many, many, many years, actually. There's some other iPhone apps that are uh, have some intriguing capabilities. Spiral Cam and Milky Cam are free. They do image stacking, dark frames, and a whole bunch more capabilities. They even do star registration on non-tracking Altaz mounts. And the way that that works is you put your object like in the center of the eyepiece, you start doing the image capturing, and as the object drifts across the field of view, because it's a non-tracking mount, it'll get over towards the edge of the field of view. We'll pause the image capture, move the object back across the field of view to the other side, and resume the image capture. And as it moves across that field of view, the app keeps the stars registered. So it's pretty slick that it can do that. Milky Cam Raw Nocturne is also free. It does image stacking, and it even does field ro derotation. So if you have a tracking out as mount, uh, you can take advantage of this app because uh, it'll do the field derotation for you. But there is no star registration, so you need a pretty accurate tracking mount. Wavelet Cam, by the same author as those other two apps, um, three apps, is uh, free. And what it does is it does wavelet imaging processing of any astrophotograph that you happen to have on your iPhone, whether it's taken on the iPhone or some other program, some other imager that's on your iPhone. You can do some pretty sophisticated wavelet imaging processing. I'm not going to talk about that. If you're an astrophotographer who does all those hours and hours and hours of capturing photons and hours and hours and hours of processing images, you know what wavelet imaging processing is and what benefits it can bring to you. So this this is kind of a neat app. I encourage you to see the reviews page on my Cassiopeia website because I've got more information on the iPhone apps and those smartphone adapters there. So let's talk some more details about iCap camera. <clears throat> so it does provide full control over the ISO value, the shutter speed, white balance, focus, camera lens you're going to use that has digital zoom, and you can lock all the settings. So there's the basic user interface with a live view of the moon uh, or whatever you're going to be imaging. So that's what you see in the app. You adjust the ISO, the shutter speed, white balance, focus using live sliders on the screen. So you touch the screen, you move left and right at the top of the white balance, down at the bottom for the focus, up and down on the right for exposure, up and down on the left for ISO settings. So that's very easy to adjust your exposures. ISO range goes from very, very low all the way up to doggone pretty high, 32,000 on the latest model iPhones. So that's a pretty high ISO. Shutter speeds go from one second on the current iPhones uh, all the way down to a very, very short uh, shutter speed, you know, 100,000th of a second. The older iPhones, however, their cameras are limited to, depending on the model, a third of a second maximum exposure to a, a half a second. Full white balance range, you got full focus range with 100 being infinity. There are built-in auto modes, which use artificial intelligence to try to determine the best image, but that's used mostly during the daytime. So even though it may kick in for your nighttime pictures, which you'll see this AI exposure tag right here, uh, it's really kind of meaningless for, uh, for astrophotography. So a bunch of other enhancements you can make for your imaging. It has a lot, what's called the light boost function. You can turn on noise reduction, and you can do black and white images. There's also special modes for all, certain types of images. So you can do long exposure, stars, International Space Station, or any satellite, light trails, star trails, and medias. And I'll talk briefly about each one of those in a second. 
There's a whole slew of other settings. You can turn on geotagging if you want to know your latitude and longitude of where you were taking your pictures at night. You can turn on a grid function so you can see where the center is of uh, the field of view. You can specify how strong you want that light boost and noise reduction to be. You can set the photo quality from JPEG or high quality JPEG, but I recommend using the TIFF mode to get the best out of your post processing. You can turn on a self timer delay, it has a very nice intervalometer where you set the number of photos you want to take um, from uh, one to 999. You can set the exposure time from one to 3,600 seconds. You can set the interval between exposures from anything you want up to 60 seconds. And you can see how much, how strong you want that ISO boost to be. You can also turn on a function that allows you to have a remote shutter. And I'll talk about that briefly in a little bit. So the, what the app does is it stacks those images that it starts taking those one second exposures uh, for long exposure and several other exposure modes. It takes multiple exposures at that shutter speed and that, that ISO, and then it stacks them on the device. So you can see all of these little buttons that icons that you'll click to turn on the various modes there in the, in the settings window. You'll use long exposure for astrophotography with tracking mounts, but there's no star registration. So you do need a, a good tracking mount. Or an auto guider. We're going to use tripod for the other modes typically. So light trails are intended for a car trail, a car, you know, headlights, taillights moving down the highway or for fireworks. Stars mode, if you want to just capture stars or aurora. Star trails mode builds up star trails as the earth rotates and you can watch it building up on the screen. So plug your phone into an AC adapter um, and then, you know, started taking pictures up around you know the north celestial pole the northern sky and you'll build up these very nice uh, colorful star trail pictures uh, and just watch it build up on the screen and when you get tired of having it done or you want to wait for you know two and a half hours or three hours when you stop the exposure you're going to have your image of all the star trails automatically ISS mode does something similar where it takes multiple exposures and stacks the trail of the space station or other bright satellites crossing the sky. The meteor mode is kind of neat when it works. It takes images every few seconds and analyzes the images for streaks and throws out the one where it and throws out the images where it doesn't see any streaks. Uh, older phones, it may not work as well. Newer phones, it'll work a little bit better. Kind of depends upon your sky brightness, the brightness of the meteors and you know, how many other airplanes and satellites you have crossing the sky. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to, to play with. Typical exposure settings. Everybody always wants to know, what do you set a cab camera for? Well, for the night sky on a tripod or a tracking mount, piggyback or whatever, you're going to use the low, you know, sort of the middle range of the ISO settings. You're going to set the shutter speed in the one quarter second to one second. And you're going to take an exposure that lasts from seconds to hours, like for the star trails. For the moon, typically you're going to use a low ISO setting, a fairly fast shutter speed, depending on the phase, of course, how bright is that moon showing up in the eyepiece. For planets, again, typically a lower ISO setting, one second. If it's a paint planet, up to a, a short exposure of a 500th of a second, depending on the brightness. So when Venus is getting very bright right now, it's going to be a much shorter shutter speed. For the stars, like globular clusters, or open star clusters, you know, typically in that low to medium ISO range, typically a one second exposure. And depending on how bright those stars are, you may take anywhere from a 10 second to a 60 second exposure. Again, for 10 seconds, it's going to take one picture every second. It's going to take a picture that's a one second shutter speed, and it takes 10 of those and stacks them together. For 60 seconds, it takes 60 of those one second exposures and stacks those. For deep sky objects, you're probably going to want to turn on light boost. 
you probably, depending on how bright it is, going to be in the middle, the very high ISO settings. Again, you want the slowest possible shutter speed because you want to maximize the amount of light that's getting onto the sensor over a period of time. And exposure length, you know, how many images is it going to stack? 30 to 60 seconds. Now, one little caveat there, in all of my testing, I have never seen much advantage of going beyond 60 seconds. It just doesn't seem to collect that much more data to make a usable image. Cautionary high ISO and light boost can certainly show noise, especially on the older iPhones. So sometimes reducing the ISO value, but turning on light boost can give you a better image than using both. And alternatively, switch them around. Sometimes you'll get a better image with higher ISO, but turning light boost off. So again, it's a digital image. Play, delete the ones that don't work. It's going to depend upon the object, how bright it is, how faint it is, the telescope that you're using, how much aperture you have, typically the magnification, your phone model, and again, your exposure length. Apple Camera App. So back in iOS 13, a few years ago, the, app, the camera app included this night mode for the, the then current model, the iPhone 11 models, and it works with all the later models since then. It does an amazing high dynamic range imaging to enhance the look of low illumination photographs. It's automatically turned on. You cannot turn it on manually, but you can turn it off. Exposure length will typically default to three seconds, depending on the phone model and the scene that you're trying to photograph. You can maybe get up between 10 and 30 seconds longer exposure. And again, what it's doing is stacking multiple images. So it makes night sky astrophotography possible. So here's our recent Venus-Jupiter conjunction with my observatory. Uh, they're getting closer together on the left, even closer in the middle. And then the night of closing conjunction, uh, we were cloudy, uh, but I managed to catch a break and ran outside with my iPhone and took a picture there on the right. Uh, so that's when they were closest together. So again, that's just night mode, handheld sky pictures. But again, you can get foreground objects like the observatory. So that's kind of cool. This is zodiacal light or zodiacal light if you prefer. I prefer zodiacal because it's the zodiac. Uh, so there's the zodiacal light from my nice dark sky location here in Oracle, Arizona, uh, taken with an iPhone. So it's pretty cool that you can get that. Works great on the Orion Nebula. So again, a night mode, uh, three second exposure uh, through the telescope of the Orion Nebula. And what's neat about it, because it is an HDR image, there in the center of the, the nebula, you can make out where the, the four stars of the trapezium are. It has an overexposed that area. <clears throat> so let's talk about a bunch of tips now. If you're hand holding, or even if you're mounted on the uh, an eyepiece, if you touch the screen, you may induce some vibrations. So if, if your camera app has it, use a self timer to allow for a delay after you press the on-screen shutter button. You can use the what's called the hat trick method. For those of us who are old film camera people, uh, we knew about the hat trick method. If your camera app has a bulb setting, then you can block off the light coming into the telescope uh, with your hat, or you can see me using a piece of cardboard with my ETX-90 there on the right. So you open up the shutter, you pull the obstruction out of the way for as long as you want to take the exposure, cover the uh, lens, to cover up the uh, aperture of the telescope, and then close the shutter. With an iPhone, you can use the earbuds volume control as a remote shutter release, assuming that you have old earphones from an older model iPhone, because they don't ship them anymore with earphones, earbuds. Uh, that kind of technique may work with some model Android phones. I don't really know but you use the volume control as your shutter release. You don't have to touch the phone that way. You can also use the Apple Watch to preview and start and stop exposures. So there on the right-hand side, you can see a live view on my Apple Watch from Nightcap camera of M51 Whirlpool Galaxy. 
And again, you just touch the shutter button to start the exposure and stop it later on. There are also Bluetooth connected remote shutter releases. So uh, those work out really well too. As I mentioned before, um, getting the camera lens uh, centered up over the eyepiece can be a challenge. So if you have a bright object like the moon or some open star clusters, it makes it much easier to get the camera lens centered over the eyepiece. You can also point a flashlight into the telescope to illuminate the eyepiece field of view. So there you see the, the nightcap camera screen being illuminated by a red flashlight just shining into the aperture of the telescope. You can remove the eyepiece from the telescope with the camera attached on your mount, point the eyepiece at a, at a light, distant light, light on the floor or whatever. Ideally, you wanna place the camera lens at the same distance as the eyepiece eye relief. So if you have a long um, eye relief eyepiece, the camera lens needs to be a little bit further away. If you have a short, I relieve eyepiece, then the camera lens has to be closer to the eyepiece. And that will maximize the field of view as seen by the camera. Getting proper alignment and distance will yield your best field illumination. So here's some examples. So now you can see what the eyepiece field of view looks like if you're too far away. The camera lens is too far away from the eyepiece. So you have this restricted field of view. If you get too close, you're going to get uneven illumination. Uh, lower left-hand corner, you see a little bit better view, but the view down the lower right-hand corner, I'm in pretty good position there, pretty close to the eye relief distance and centered up over the eyepiece. So some more examples. So here's Centaurus A galaxy. It's visible from here uh, where I live in southern Arizona, very low in the sky. But I haven't gotten on either one of those two pictures the camera lens properly centered over the eyepiece. So you can see this kind of bright area off to the right side or the left side, depending on which side of the eyepiece I was trying to get on. But if you get properly centered up over the eyepiece at the right distance, again, the eye relief distance, then you get a view like this. Bright objects, Moon, Venus, and Jupiter can overexpose some camera apps, especially the auto exposure modes. So use a moon filter or polarizing filter to reduce the brightness. So you can see a couple examples there. You can zoom in to check and adjust the eyepiece focus. So get those star points you know, nice and sharp. You may need to do that focusing both with the telescope focus and the app focus. So uh, sometimes you might think you need to be like on my cap camera at a full 100 infinity focus. Not necessarily true. So zoom in, check the focus with both eyepiece adjustment and the camera adjustment. If your camera allows, camera app allows, lock the focus once you have the image in focus. And again, if your camera app allows, manually adjust the exposure to get the best exposure. Of course, just like with all astrophotography, bracketing the images using different exposures increases your chances of getting that picture that you really want to have. Use a low magnification to maximize faint object brightness. So if you're photographing some faint DSOs, you want as much light as you can concentrated in a small area. You can use higher magnification, though, on globular clusters and bright planetary nebulae. Keeping the eyepiece, eyepiece eye cup attached can keep stray light from hitting the camera lens. So like in light polluted in San Francisco, you may need to keep the eyepiece uh, eye cup attached to the eyepiece. But some of the adapters may require you to move that eyepiece eye cup. So see which works out for you. Use a clean eyepiece to avoid dust stones. So there you can see a picture of Mercury, I believe it was, way back when. A nice little crescent Mercury, but lots of dust on the eyepiece. And so when you're imaging, especially uh, twilight kind of imaging, or even moon imaging or sun imaging, a dirty eyepiece will show these uh, dust donuts. So clean your eyepiece. Using digital zoom or a telephoto lens may or may not improve the image. Just give it a try. You, you, you may be happy with the results, you may not be. <clears throat> Do ensure that the adapter is securely attached to the eyepiece and your phone is secure on the adapter, or ensure that
phone fall off. It's happened to me once in all my years. It fell off. <laughs> experiment, experiment, experiment. Don't get frustrated with your initial attempts. So I see a question here, just glanced over to the chat. I see somebody was asking about the stool I was sitting on. That's a starbound observing chair. It's a nicely padded uh, chair. I think they claim it'll support body weight up to about 300 pounds. It slides up and down. Um, it's a very nice one. I've actually worn out, I think, three of them because <laughs> I really do like them. And they, it's, they use it a lot. So let's talk about this LiDAR issue. So back when the iPhone 12 Pro models came out and continuing with all the later models, Apple added this LiDAR, light detection and ranging sensor. It's useful for low light autofocusing as well as 3D imaging. That's how they do all of these uh, perspective kinds of stuff and 3D modeling and, and all kinds of really neat stuff uh, with the iPhones nowadays. And then the, the, the iPads, the new model iPads as well. Uh, so it really does have a very useful issue. But it adds stray light when you're doing low light uh, astrophotography through an eyepiece or even through a microscope or rectoscope or binoculars. It doesn't really matter. So I was out um, right after I got my iPhone 13 Pro Max a couple of years ago. Um, I was out imaging the Eagle Nebula. So you can see the Eagle Nebula there. But I have these flying saucers in the field of view. Could not figure out where that stray light was coming from. I was turning off lights in the observatory. I was turning, hiding lights, you know, red LEDs off the telescope. I was trying to track down this thing. Uh, so finally, you know, I couldn't find anything in the observatory that was creating these lights. So I came inside the house, went into a dark room, aimed a camera, aimed the phone at, the, at a mirror, and sure enough, there were those lights that were showing up uh, in, the, in the live view of the camera. So uh, useful for some things. Boy, not real useful if you're trying to photograph through an eyepiece. And you can't turn it off. Apple has not provided a way for either you as a user or developers to be able to access a way to turn it off. We've all been beating up on Apple, both developers and me and other people. We need a way to turn it off because iPhones are used in schools for STEM. You know, they attach them to microscopes attachment to telescopes. So we'd like to have a way to turn it off, but we can't do it. So how do you get around that? Well, you cover the LiDAR port. So here's where the LiDAR port is on my iPhone 13 Pro Max with the three lenses and then the little black sensor down there at the bottom. So that's kind of what it looks like in all the phone models that have LiDAR. So you want to cover that. Well, you could take a piece of black electrical tape or black masking tape and cover it, but I didn't want to put a sticky thing on there. I didn't want to use painter, uh, the painter tape, masking tape. Uh, so I wanted to come up with a, a different solution. So I designed this little cover that I just clip on with some telephoto lens clips. It's just a small piece of black cardboard with cutouts for where the lenses are. And I just clip it on to the backside of the phone. And that works out really well. Apps like Graphic Converter, which is one of my favorite apps on the Macintosh, Photos, of course, GIMP, Lightroom, Photoshop, they can all be used to make some improvements in your smartphone images. And we're only going to talk very briefly about this. You can do what's called stretching, which are levels, adjusting levels. You can sharpen the image. You can play with noise reduction. You can do some color adjustments. And you can do more, depending upon the apps that you're using. So there are some advantages of doing this. So once you've got your best image selected, doing two basic simple editing steps, whether on a, on your small smartphone, on your tablet, on your Mac or your Windows computer, doing these two simple editing steps is going to help a lot, as you'll see. So again, applying levels adjustments or stretching, use to enhance contrast, the brightness, bring out shadows or the paint areas, and you can darken the sky background. You'll sharpen the image to improve the look and make the image look sharper. So here's a photograph, you know, just a straight photograph of the moon through the, through the eyepiece. And there on the right hand side, you can see the levels adjustment in graphics converter. And so what photographers typically do when they're, come on, uh, what photographers typically do when they're editing is they want to move these sliders down at the bottom of a histogram to where the shoulders are into the edge of the shoulders. So we're going to move this high 
arrow towards this way to touch come over here and touch the, the shoulder of the histogram. And so you get an image that looks like this. So that brightens up the image. Then you can do other adjustments here with the shadows using the middle slider or the dark areas uh, with the, the left-hand slider. But once you've got that step done, then you want to sharpen the image. And again, you can adjust the sharpening. Don't go overboard because you get lots of artifacts in. But there's usually a nice sweet spot that will give you a nice sharp image. So again, the unsharpened image and then the sharpened image. <clears throat> So those two simple steps you should do to all your astrophotographs. So astrophotography has never been as easy or as fun as it is today. So back in those late glass plate film days, or rather nights if you prefer, astrophotographers would take a few images each night and they would process them, hoping they got one or two good images. Today, using CCD imagers and digital cameras, amateur uh, astrophotographers take many images each night, still throwing out the bad ones, but they, of course, get many good ones. There's lots of high-quality imagers and telescopes that cost lots of bucks, and post-processing can take a lot of time. But, geez, today's smartphones have those amazing cameras, and some camera apps will really extend the low-light capabilities, so it can be a great choice for many people. So just to give you some final uh, images to get you even more intrigued about what you can do with a smartphone, Flame Nebula, really neat object. Of course, you got the bright star close to it, but you can bring out the frame neb Flame Nebula uh, with an iPhone, with a smartphone. Running Man Nebula, one of my favorite objects on the cover of my autobiography, done with just an iPhone. And are you ready for this? Horsehead Nebula, imaged with an iPhone through a 12-inch telescope. So. You can do almost anything. I refer you to an article that I wrote for Astronomy Magazine back in November of 2021. Uh, a lot of the same kind of tips I've talked about here tonight, uh, but there's a lot of good, art, good information in this article. Uh, NASA also has a guide to smartphone astrophotography. It's a free book online. Um, it's pretty large, 192 pages, got lots of really good information about doing smartphone astrophotography. Unfortunately, it has not a lot about doing iPhone smartphone astrophotography, but it does have a lot of good general tips in it. So if you can see it in the eyepiece, or even if you can't, like the Horsehead Nebula, you can probably photograph it with a smartphone. So start doing some astrophotography with your iPhones or your Android phones. So that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we'll see if you got any questions. Thanks, Mike. Um, not really seeing uh, much in the chat that hasn't already been answered. Um, does anyone have any further questions? Uh, if you'll raise your hand. Hey, Bill, there was an early comment from Rachel. She said she's a beginner who's using binoculars, and she was hoping to address, um, that Mike would address uh, astrophotography using binoculars. And I think we saw a little of that, but I wanted to circle back and see if Rachel had any further questions. So um, I think my question would be, there's a lot of information presented, very helpful, but where would you suggest focus on kind of just one or two things to begin? using binoculars, what would you suggest? So binoculars are nice for doing, you know, obviously, wide fields. So, um, you know, things like beehive cluster, Pleiades, uh, or planetary conjunctions or planetary moon conjunctions. Uh, moon, anything's got the moon in there can be a bit of a challenge because of the exposure you know, you can overexpose the moon to try to get the planet, or you can un you can properly expose the moon, but you'll lose the planet. Uh, so it's a little bit of a challenge doing anything that has the moon, you know, with some other object in the field of view. Um, but you can do some pretty neat things. Um, Andromeda Galaxy comes to mind. That's a very nice object in a pair of binoculars because you got the nice wide field. You do need to have a tracking mount that your binoculars are mounted on for that, though, because uh, you need to do the longer exposures, obviously. But for star clusters, you know, Orion Nebula, 
you know, those kind of, you know, right now go out and photograph the Orion Nebula uh, with a pair of binoculars. You can do that. And you really don't need a tracking mount. Just keep the exposure short. You may have to pump up the ISO. Thank you very much. Any other questions? You know, Bill, there was also, there was so much great information presented, Mike. Thank you very much. I was starting to take notes and then I realized I couldn't keep up. And one of the folks on the call had asked if this was being recorded and it was. And so I just wanted to provide a link to everybody. You can go to the SFAA um, page where we have uh, a link to our archived <laughs> lectures and you can uh, view those through the SFAA YouTube channel. So I'm going to put that link out here for everyone right now. And you can certainly search on the SFAA website and find it that way as well. But I'll put it here for your convenience. And I'll be adding that link up onto the videos page of my Cassiope Observatory website as well. So uh, we, not, we do have a question uh, now uh, from Mike Hunsinger. Hunt, excuse me, Hunsinger. Uh, can Mike say something about photographing the Milky Way? So you saw the picture of the zodiacal light. What I've been a little bit surprised about is how difficult it is for my dark sky area to photograph the Milky Way with an iPhone, either using nightcap camera or the camera app in night mode. Uh, the surface brightness of the Milky Way, even though it's brighter in the core region than the zodiacal light, from where I live, the, the, the core of the Milky Way is down into a little bit of the light pollution from the communities that are south of uh, Oracle. Um, so things like Tucson, even though they have stringent outdoor lighting codes because of all the professional observatories around, there's still a little bit of the sky glow down very low on the horizon. And that's kind of messing up my pictures of the uh, Milky Way. Uh, but you can do it. Uh, you're going to need a little bit more post-processing to bring out the faintness of the Milky Way, but it can be done. Um, I've seen pictures with Android phones uh, that look actually better than what the iPhone is currently doing. Now, my iPhone is a 13 Pro Max. I don't have the 14s. I do plan on getting a 15 Pro Max uh, this fall when it comes out, so we'll see if that changes anything. Um, but certainly the newer phones can do it. Um, just, it will depend upon the conditions and, and um, how much you want to try to do some, with some editing. But as you saw with the zodiacal light, a very faint object, very visible here in my dark sky location because it's in the western sky where there is no light pollution, no sky glow, uh, can be done, can be done. Great, okay. We have a few additional questions that have come in. Uh, Kirk Bender. Um, uh, for iPhone astrophotos, is it better to take photos in RAW uh, than J, uh, JPG? So I played with using the RAW mode ProRes um, in the camera app and haven't really been that pleased with the way the results are coming out for astrophotography for faint objects. Um, I just haven't been able to do the same degree of editing that I thought I could do in Lightroom. Um, with those uh, raw photographs. So from Nightcap camera, like I said, I typically use the TIFF image format because that gives me the most flexibility uh, when I'm editing over in Lightroom. Um, and for the camera app, it just saved them out in their, uh, their HEIC format. So that works well for me. Okay, here's another question uh, from Ikea. Uh, hi, Mike. Can you suggest some good adapters for Android smartphones or a website uh, that uh, might might discuss this? Uh... So, so the um, the smartphone adapters, like I mentioned, come in sort of two types. Uh, there's the universal adapters, and they work with Android phones as well as iPhones. So, uh, the only thing you have to worry about there is it the adjustable enough for the size of your smartphone. So if you have a very large Android phone or a very large iPhone, you need to be certain you're getting an adapter that's going to support the width of the that particular model smartphone. Uh, the other adapters that come with a case, of course, those are very specific to that 
particular model of a smartphone that you have, whether it's Android, Android or iPhone. Um, but if you go again to my Cassiopeia website, click on the reviews tab up in the menu at the top, uh, you'll see some smartphone adapters there I, that I've reviewed. Of course, I'm using the iPhone, but I do talk about the specs and, and you can find links to their pages there. But again, that Levenhook adapter, it's very inexpensive. Um, they had a supply problem during COVID, uh, but I think they've gotten past that now and they, they have a good stock of them again. Uh, it's a very nice, solid adapter. It's lightweight. Uh, I really do like the Levenhook adapter, and it'll work with almost any phone that's out there today. Okay, uh, another question from uh, Cal Hunsinger. Uh, do you have experience using filters to cut down sunshine? I assume this would be for daytime, not photography. Uh, nope, haven't. Uh, I've looked through a um, um, one of those uh, sort of smart telescopes that they do have some intriguing capabilities. They do some really nice stuff in their software. Um, they're great for visual use and great for capturing images. And I've seen lots of really nice pictures that they've done online, posted online. So they they do have it, you know, they're, they're not a cheap telescope system, it's somewhere around $3,000 or so. Um, but you do get a nice capability with them. So it, uh, that may be coming the, you know, the, uh, the current trend in, in sort of low end astrophotography, if you will, just like smartphone astrophotography. All right, you're, you're referring to the question about Stolita smart telescopes. So I see a question there about um, uh, a Facebook group or someplace for dedicated discussions about smartphone. Uh, astrophotography haven't uh, seen anything like that um, sounds like a really neat idea um, if somebody ever wanted to create something like that I might join it uh, but we'll see how that goes uh, I'll see another question about using filters to cut down on uh, uh, the light pollution sky go kinds of stuff the problem with using filters especially for you know D when you're trying to do DSO imaging you know if you're using uh, the UHC filters or light pollution filters um, or any of the you know, very narrow band filtering, you're just cutting out too much light that's getting onto the sensor. Um, so you're not really going to have much success with fainter objects, the SOs. How about the brighter objects like the moon? Would you be able to use filters with, with, with that kind of... I haven't of tried it uh, with uh, like M57 or the Orion Nebula. Uh, just because I live on a dark sky site. So I haven't really felt the need to do that. Um, certainly, if you have the filters, you could experiment. Um, you're still going to have to pump up the ISO um, to bring out the object. Um, and, you know, like I said, then you get the trade offs of dealing with the noise. So, all right. Any other questions? I think we've covered all of them. If, if not, Anybody has a question, they just want to raise their hand or um, unmute themselves and ask the question. Hey, Bill, I wonder if you might yeah. want to mention the astrophotography uh, special, the special interest group. Um, everyone on this uh, Zoom might not be aware of it. Oh, yes, okay, thanks, Liz. So uh, the San Francisco Amateur Astronomers have a special interest group. Um, for uh, those interested in astrophotography. And uh, to participate in that group, you do need to be a member. And if you're not a member, but you're interested in becoming a member, please go to our website, sfaa-astronomy.org. And uh, there's information there on how to join. And um, uh, we would uh, welcome, uh, welcome your participation. We also have a Slack channel for astrophotography. Uh, that's part of the uh, SFA platform that you can join as well from our, our, our website. And by the way, Slack is, uh, the SFA Slack is a great forum to ask all kinds of questions um, uh, to other members. All right, not seeing any raised hands. So uh, 
I guess we will go ahead and conclude then. Thank you so much, Mike. That was just a great presentation and very clear uh, and just full of information. Everybody do, do be aware, as mentioned, this is available on YouTube. If you wanna go back and watch the whole thing or watch parts of it, um, it, it is there and just, just chock full of great tips and information. So thanks everyone for joining us and- uh, Thank you for having me, really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Mike.